Yes, sir. You can share your screen, madam. Okay, or, uh, okay. Uh, put on your Please let me know when I can start. Uh, no, Madam, Madam, don't say that. So we we'll start, start. Uh, for the next session, yeah. and the next session will be uh, taken by um, Sudeshna Dash and Professor G L Park, and they will be uh, taking the session. Uh, mostly, it will be lab session. So they will be uh, taking it on machine learning and deep learning with uh, speak it learn and tensor flow. <clears throat> Shudhakar Dash is a PhD candidate at IIT Kharagpur, working under the supervision of Dr. <coughs> Gail Park. Her research work focuses on language technology. She she did her MTech in computer science and engineering from NIT Durgapur, 2016. And B.Tech in Computer Science and Engineering from W. Bart, 2014. Ma'am, uh, I will request you. Uh, you can please start the session. Uh, thank you, Tanushri, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sudeshna Das. As uh, ma'am has said, I am a PhD student at IIT Kharagpur, working under the supervision of Dr. Jiaul Pai. In today's Uh, lab session we will focus on uh, building machine learning and deep learning models in real life using the python programming language to do this we will use google colab uh, google colab allows us to create files called notebooks these notebooks are interactive oh. in nature हेलो और ये स्टार्ट हो रहे छ तो अच्छा ठीक है ठीक है अम शुड आई कंटिन्यू और बिगिन अगेन नो नो यू कैन कंटिन्यू ओके ओके बिकॉज़ देयर इज सम बैकग्राउंड ओके फाइन वी ट्राइंग टू सो ओके सो अम these notebooks are uh, interactive in nature which means that we will be able to run small parts of code and get the output immediately instead of having to run the entire code at a time as we do with programming languages like c c++ or java so what you see in front of you is a google colab notebook um, as you can see it contains images uh, text as well as code uh, which we'll see later uh now uh, the most important feature of colab notebooks is that it lets you run python code without having to install anything on your system so all you need is a google account and a web browser uh so to use colab the first step that you have to do is you have to sign up for your into your uh, sign in into your gmail or google account and then navigate to this link uh, colab.research.google.com this will open up uh, an introductory notebook and a dialog box that looks like this so uh, this is the dialog box that you get on top and behind this is the introductory notebook so uh, when you get this dialog box uh, you have to click on new notebook now uh, clicking on the new notebook option will give you a fresh notebook with a light gray box uh, that you can see on the screen here and these boxes uh, are called cells 
we will write our entire code inside these cells. So uh, let's say uh, I want to create a variable called x and I want to give it a value of 3 and um, I want to print the value of x. So I have written my code inside this cell. Now to run uh, the code I have written, I will click on this uh, uh, round button that we have here. So this will uh, run the cell. That is the code inside the cell will be executed if I click on this. So as you can see that uh, the code is running and I get the output just be, uh, beneath the cell. Now, uh, let's say I want to declare another variable. Um, so for that, I will click on plus code, which is basically this option. And this will insert another cell just beneath the, the previous cell. So if I declare a variable y equals 4 and um, I set z equals x plus y and I print the value of z. And uh, once I run this, I'll get the output for this uh, snippet of code. So uh, you can see here that I did not have to declare uh, declare the value of x again. So whatever I have done till before this particular cell is already retained in the memory. Uh, so I have a question from Madhulina Sar. Uh, saying please show how to upload file in Google Lab, uh, Google Colab. Uh, I'll come to that later in the uh, talk. So please bear with me. Okay, so uh, this is what uh, a fresh notebook looks like. We now know that these are cells and we can write our code in these cells and we can click on this button to execute them. So uh, now that uh, I, we are familiar with uh, the basics of Google Colab, like we know uh, how Google Colab looks like and uh, how it works. So now we are going to start our lab session formally. So uh, in this session, we will look at uh, two very popular Python libraries. Uh, the first one is a machine learning library called Scikit-Learn, which is the most popular machine learning library that we have in Python. And the second library is uh, TensorFlow, which is uh, the most popular deep learning library that we have in uh, Python. So uh, scikit-learn basically gives us ready-made templates that we can use to build our own machine learning models. So it has uh, built-in templates for uh, popular clustering models like k-means, uh, classification models like k-nearest neighbors, SVM and many more functionalities that we can use without having to implement everything from scratch. So it takes care of all the uh, backend details, all the nitty gritties and all the mathematical computation. And it just gives us a template which we can use to create our own models. Now, uh, there are some basic steps that we follow when implementing a machine machine learning or deep learning model. The first step is loading data. And uh, the second step is data pre-processing. The third step is training uh, followed by prediction. Now, uh, depending on the data that we are using, the problem that we are trying to solve or the model that we are using, there can be some additional steps as well. But these four steps are the basic, uh, most common steps that we usually follow in almost all uh, ML uh, and DL uh, model building. Prasada. Hmm? Hmm. So uh, now uh, we are going to start with the first step, which is loading data. Now there are two ways to load data in Colab. Uh, the first uh, option is uh, where we use uh, an inbuilt data set. So uh, the, these are inbuilt data sets that are available with scikit-learn. And the second way. Uh, And the uh, second way is to use our own data set, which we can upload into Colab from our computer. Uh, we will uh, learn how to use our own data mm. a little later in this session. Uh, for now, we will learn how to use it learns in built data sets.
Now, uh, Scikit-Learn has some popular data sets included with it. These inbuilt data sets are generally small in size. Say, uh, uh, so these inbuilt data sets are small in size, say a few hundred, uh, hundred data points. And um, you can find a complete list of all such data sets available uh, with Scikit-Learn in this link. Okay, so uh, now we are going to look at the IRIS data set, which we are going to use for our first demonstration. Now, uh, the IRIS data set is a popular classification data set. Here, we are dealing with the problem of multi-class classification. That is, we have three classes. Now, these uh, each of these three classes is denoted by, an, uh, by a positive integer value. The first class uh, is uh, the Citosa class, which is denoted by zero. The second class is the Versicolor, uh, excuse me, yeah, the Versicolor uh, class, which is denoted by the label of one. And the third class is the Virginica class, which is denoted by the label of two. Now, um, this data set has 150 samples. And uh, each of these samples contains four features. These four features are uh, sepal length, petal length, uh, sepal width, and petal width. Now we'll look at an image uh, which will explain this data set better. Uh, this image shows the three different types of uh, iris flowers. The first one is the iris versicolor. The second one is the iris virginica. And the third one is the iris citosa. So uh, here uh, in the first panel, you can see that uh, the sepal length is denoted by this dashed yellow line. The uh, sepal width is given by the solid yellow line. The petal width is given by the solid uh, blue line and the petal uh, length is given by the dashed blue line. So similarly, we have measurements of sepal length, petal length and so on for uh, the versicolor flowers, virginica flowers and the citosa flowers. Now, this data set is a very balanced data set uh, because we have 150 samples here. So uh, of these 50 samples are of the citosa class, 50 of the virginica class and 50 of the versicolor class. Now, this uh, is a very ideal data set because it's extremely balanced. Uh, but in real life, when we are dealing with maybe say research problems and all, uh, we can come up, uh, we uh, have to co uh, come in, uh, co uh, we have to deal with imbalanced data as well. Uh, but for now, let us look at this balanced data example because it's a very simple and uh, classic uh, data set. Okay, so uh, now essentially uh, what we want to do here is that uh, we have the sepal and petal measurements for 150 different flowers. Now, using these measurements, we want to build a classifier. What will this classifier do? When I give a new sample to this classifier, it should be able to classify the new sample into one of the three different flower types. That is all we are doing here. Now comes the coding part. So uh, in, uh, just look at the first line. In the first line, we are fetching into memory the part of scikit-learn that contains the iris data set. Now, uh, uh, if you're not very familiar with programming or Python, think of it uh, like this. Let's say I have a very big library. Uh, inside this library, I have some bookshelves. And in one of these bookshelves, I have a book containing the iris data. Now, uh, uh, here the library is scikit-learn which is written as sklearn. So sklearn is basically the short form of scikit-learn that uh, we are using here. And the bookshelf in which I have the data set is called data sets. Now, uh, scikit-learn uh, or sklearn.datasets basically tells Python that the data set which I want to fetch is at this location. You have to go to this bookshelf to find the book containing my iris data set. Now, from this location, I uh, because I want to get the iris data, uh, and the book containing the iris data is called load iris. Let's say, uh, just take it as an analogy to understand it better. 
now uh, we have found the book containing the id data uh, using this line now uh, we we'll, uh, we want to pick up that book from the bookshelf so uh, in terms of programming uh, what we do is we load the data set into the main memory so that is what we are doing in the second line so uh, this iris uh, variable that i have variable name that i have taken is basically going to contain uh, the iris data set or all the contents of uh, the load iris method now uh, after this line uh, after this line is executed um, the uh, the uh, data is loaded into memory now uh, this data set contains uh, the features or measurements uh, as well as the class label for each sample now uh, iris dot data which you see here contains the feature values for all 150 samples and iris dot target contains the class labels for all 150 samples so uh, in this line what we are doing is we will store all the features uh, in an array or matrix called features and uh, we will store all the class labels in an array or container called classes okay so uh, do we have any questions till now okay so uh, okay fine so we'll proceed now uh, i want to uh, see the shape of the container or the uh, array in which i have stored my features so uh, these are the lines that i have in this cell now uh, i'm going to execute this cell so all the lines inside this cell will be run and the features shape will uh, the shape of the features matrix will be printed so uh, the shape is 150 4 so uh, as you can see that the array has taken the shape of uh, the features that we had the 150 here tells us that uh, the number of rows in this array is 150 and the 4 here tells us that the uh, number of columns that we have in uh, features is 4 this is because there is one column for each feature and we have four features so uh let's say that i want to see uh, the first uh okay so i have a question saying for features we don't have to import numpy for array uh we don't have to import numpy for array because uh, this data set is already preprocessed and loaded into a scikit learn data set format uh we will use numpy uh, in the later example that we see where we load our own custom data so for this example uh, because we are using an inbuilt data set we do not need any external library like numpy i hope that answers your question right so uh, let's uh, look at the first five samples in the features matrix so uh, this is what the features matrix looks like i am printing only the first five samples here now uh, you can see that uh, each row contains uh, the features of one sample so the first value will be for uh, petal weight the second one for sepal weight and so on so the, uh, the this is what the first five samples looks like if i want to print say the first um, say 15 samples i'll just change this to 15 and once i run this cell we get the first 15 uh, feature, uh, features for the first 15 samples now uh, let's look at uh, the classes uh, shape so this has the shape of 150 Uh, so basically we have one class label for each of the 150 samples now uh, let's print the first five class label uh, class labels that we have so the first five class labels that we have are all zero and uh, let us also see the names of uh, the classes so here the class labels are 0 1 and 2 uh, if the class label is zero it means that the flower belongs to the citosa type if the class label is 1 it means that the flower belongs to the versicolor type and if the class label is 2 then the uh, flower is of the virginica type 
So now that we know what our data set looks like, uh, the next step that we follow is we split data set into two parts, the training set and the test set. Now, uh, usually what we do is we take a 80-20 split or a 70-30 split. That is, we take 80% or 70% of the data set into our training uh, data and the rest of the 30 or 20% of the data set as our test data. So uh, here we are going to split the data into training set and test set. For this, we are going to use the train test split method uh, that is available in scikit-learn's model selection module. Now, uh, just uh, pay attention to this part of uh, the next uh, uh, statement. So what we are doing here is we are taking the train test split method and we are passing the features matrix and the classes matrix into it. And we are specifying the test size as 0.2. So in this case, I am taking 80% of the data as my training data and the uh, remaining 20% of the data as my test data. Now, uh, this particular function will return four uh, sub matrices or sub four uh, matrices. Uh, what it will return is uh, the training features, as you can see here, the test features, the training classes, and the test classes. Now, uh, if you see that uh, in this uh, function, we always have to pass the features matrix in the first position and the classes or the labels matrix in the second position. Now, uh, from the first position, the, that is the features matrix, it will be split into two parts, the train features and the test features. And the second ma uh, matrix, which is the classes or labels matrix, will again be split into two parts, the train classes and the test classes. So uh, one thing you have to be very careful about is that the first uh, position uh, matrix that you have, it should be named as train features or uh, something like training data or something like that. So basically the first uh, uh, position will have the training uh, uh, sub uh, split of the data and the second part will have the test split. By mistake, uh, if you write test features at the first position and train features in the second position, uh, what will happen is it will uh, the pro code will not give you any error, but uh, the test features will contain 80% of the samples and the training features will contain 20% of the samples and uh, that will uh, give you a very uh, bad tra badly trained classifier. So just be careful with this because this will not throw you an error. Similarly, with the uh, train classes and test classes, the train classes has to be in the first position and the test classes will be in the second position. You can uh, change the value of test size as 0.1 or 0.3 or whatever you like uh, as per uh, your the experiment that you want to run or the data that you have. It depends on you. Now uh, I want to uh, see the shape of my train features matrix. So uh, these are the three lines that I'm executing here. So uh, the shape of the train features matrix is 120 comma 4. So 80% uh, of uh, the 150 samples that we have, that is 120 samples have been uh, put uh, in, into the train features. And the shape is 4 because we have uh, 4 features in uh, each sample. Similarly, uh, now let's look at uh, the first 5 samples in the train features matrix. So these are the first five samples. Now, uh, if you uh, notice that, uh, let's look at the first sample here. This is 6, 2.2, 4, and 1. And if I look at uh, this, uh, the output of features, you'll see that the first row contains uh, uh, features that have a different value. This is because when we are using the uh, train test split method automatically the data set will be shuffled so after shuffling uh, 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 randomly 80% uh, of the data has been assigned as training and uh, uh, the rest of the 20% of the data has been assigned to the test data set so uh, this va uh, the values of the uh, 
first uh, row here and the first row in uh, that you had seen earlier will not uh, always necessarily be the same now uh, similarly let's look at the shape of uh, training classes so again you see that we have 120 samples and each uh, there's just uh, one column so it's just 120 now uh, let's look at the uh, first five uh, training classes or class labels that we have so uh, you can see that the label for the first sample here is one the second sample here is zero and so on right so uh, now uh, we can choose from any of the classifiers that we have in uh, scikit-learn you have um, the support vector machine you have uh, many of the classifiers actually uh, so if you go to the scikit-learn website, you will find the complete list of all the classifiers that are available. So for uh, this demonstration, I am going to uh, show you how to implement the KNN classifier or the K-nearest neighbor classifier. Now, I am not sure if uh, K-nearest neighbor classifier has been uh, covered in the theory part. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what the KNN classifier is. So uh, let's say I have a lot of data points. So these data points belong to uh, either class A or class B. Uh, so the red data points that you see here uh, belong to class A and the green data points that you see here belong to class B. Now, uh, these uh, data sets, let's say that these have only two features. The first feature uh, is laid along the X axis and the second feature is laid along the Y axis. Now, this uh, space is basically called your feature space. Now, in this feature space, I have uh, positioned these data points. Now, uh, let's say I have a new sample, which is given by this uh, yellow uh, point. Now, I want to classify this yellow point as either belonging to class A or belonging to class B. Now, uh, what the KNN classifier will do is that for this yellow point, it's going to find out K nearest neighbors. So uh, the value of K is generally set to be an odd number. Uh, so let's say if I set the value of K as three, in this case, uh, for this yellow point, uh, the distance from this yellow point to all the points that are in, in this uh, space will be calculated. After this, we'll find out the uh, points which have the least distance. So, uh, uh, so let's say that uh, this, the red point and these two green points have the least distance uh, from the yellow point. These are the three nearest neighbors of this yellow point. So uh, from these three, we will conduct a majority voting. Uh, so uh, as you can see in this particular example, uh, the majority or uh, of the nearest neighbors are green in color. That is, they belong to class B. So we will also assign the label of this yellow point as class B. Now, if uh, we set the value of K as seven, that is, we want to find the seven nearest neighbors. So uh, these are the seven nearest neighbors that we have to the yellow point. So uh, in this case, you see uh, that we have four class A samples uh, that are the nearest neighbors to the yellow point and three samples of class B that are the nearest neighbors to the yellow point. So because uh, the uh, uh, class A is a majority in the, among the seven nearest neighbors. In uh, If we set the value of K as seven, we will uh, assign the label of this yellow point as class A. So um, if there are no questions uh, regarding K and N classifier, we are going to proceed to the coding part. Okay, so uh, I'm going to proceed. Now, uh, here we are going to build the classifier. So to uh, build the classifier, what we are doing here is we are importing the K uh, neighbors classifier uh, object from the sklearn.neighbors submodule. Now, uh, I want to create uh, an, obje uh, an object uh, with, of the class K, near, K neighbors classifier. So uh, 
here I am specifying the number of nearest neighbors as four. And I also have to uh, uh, tell my classifier what kind of distance I want to use. So by default, uh, uh, so someone is uh, saying screen is not shared. Uh, is the Colab notebook not visible to you? No, no, it is visible. It is problem it's problem. okay. It's okay. 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 So uh, we have to uh, set uh, a distance metric uh, for the classifier. Now, by default, scikit-learn uh, has uh, implemented the Minkowski distance. Now, uh, in the Minkowski distance, if I set the value of p as 2, it becomes my Euclidean distance. If I set the value of p as 1, it becomes Manhattan distance. And if you set the value of p as greater than 2, then you have the general form of the Minkowski distance. So uh, I have set the value of p as 2. That is, we are going to use Euclidean distance to find out uh, the distance from uh, a sample to all its neighbors. Now, uh, once this uh, line is uh, executed, uh, uh, an object called KNN classifier will be created. Now, uh, inside this classifier, we have to feed in our da training data. So to do that, we write KNN classifier, which is the name of the object that we created, dot fit, and then we pass the training features as well as the training classes. Now, uh, I'm going to run this uh, part of the code and uh, the classifier will then be created. So we have created our classifier. Now, that the classifier has been created. Uh, so generally what we have with most classifiers is we will need to train them. But for KNN, there is no um, training involved as such. So whenever a new sample comes, the distance has, has to be calculated every time uh, separately. So we are skipping the training part here. There's no training process as such in this case. But in some of the classifiers like uh, MLT classifier, you will have a, a distinct training part involved as well. OK, so uh, now that our classifier is ready, now we want to predict uh, the class labels of unknown samples with uh, our classifier. So uh, if I just go scroll up, so you can see that this classifier uh, only contains the training features and training classes. So it has not seen the test classes or the test uh, features yet. So uh, I am going to use KNN classifier uh, dot predict. This is the dot predict method of uh, KNN classifier, and uh, I'm going to pass the test features to it. So if you uh, note that for the training part, I had to pass both the training features and the training classes. For the prediction part, I am only passing the test features, not the test classes. Now. Uh, all the uh, predicted labels uh, will be stored in this variable called predicted classes. Now, uh, I want to print out the uh, predictions uh, for the first five samples in the test set. So these are the predictions that we got. Uh, so my uh, KNN classifier is predicting that the first sample in the test set uh, belongs to class one, the second sample belongs to class two, and so on. Now, um, I don't know how well the prediction went. So to do that, I'm going to uh, calculate the accuracy. So uh, sci uh, we'll come to the next cell. So scikit-learn has a lot of um, uh, metrics uh, inbuilt. You have F1 score, you have area under curve, and various other metrics. So we'll use the simplest metric of all, which is the accuracy score. So uh, all the metrics are available uh, under scikit-learn.metrics. So from here, we are imp uh, importing the accuracy score. Now, uh, I'm going to print the accuracy score here. Now, uh, this accuracy score, to calculate the accuracy score, we need two uh, inputs. The first is the test classes, which is the real label of all the test uh, samples that we have. And the second one is the predicted classes, which is what we got from the previous cell, uh, the predictions uh, given by the KNN classifier. 
So if I run this, it will give us uh, an accuracy score for my classifier. So we can see an accuracy score of 0.96. So uh, the minimum uh, is zero, the maximum is one. So it's a very uh, good score that we have so far. Now, uh, yeah. so uh, now let's say that I want to find out the different probabilities that have been assigned to each class. So uh, for that, what we do here is we use KNN classifier dot predict proba. So uh, when we were predicting, we just wrote KNN classifier dot predict. When we want to predict the probabilities as well, we'll write KNN uh, dot classifier, KNN classifier dot predict underscore proba. And then we'll pass the test features. So what this will do is it will give us the probabilities for each class. So let's print the first 15, uh, uh, the probabilities for the first 15 samples. Okay, so here we have the probabilities for the first 15 samples. So all of these are pretty much like 0, 1 and so on. Let's see, uh, let's try some other samples and see if we can find something with uh, different values. Let's say, um, 22, 35. Uh, no, so we have it, most of the values as 0 and 1. In some cases, uh, if you run this uh, uh, same thing again, uh, the test split and the uh, training split will be different. You might also get values like uh, 0, 0 0.75, 0 0.25 and so on. So um, uh, from these uh, predicted probabilities, uh, you can see that uh, in the first case, uh, the uh, Probability, uh, just I'll just go back to the first five samples. Right. So if you look at the predicted probabilities, you will see that uh, in the first sample, the probability for uh, the sample belonging to class uh, zero is zero. Uh, the probability for this sample belonging to class one is one. And the probability for this uh, sample belonging to class uh, two is also zero. So this should be assigned the class label of one, as we can see here. So you can uh, verify this uh, by looking at the probabilities. OK, so do we have any questions uh, regarding uh, scikit-learn or KNN classifier or whatever we have covered uh, so far? Hello. Yes. Hello, madam. Yes. Uh, how will I uh, calculate the time complexity uh, from Kn uh, algorithm uh, for uh, classification of this? Is there any okay, technique? Uh, yes, uh, you can calculate the time complexity. That will uh, require me going into the theory. Uh, so uh, I think it's the order of uh, n square or n cube. I'm, I'm, I cannot recall it right now. But I'll have to go into the theory part in that case. And I no, haven't. I, uh, I, I know the theory, but um, from uh, any uh, coding part or any uh, technique to calculate. Okay, so you the... want to find out how much, yeah. how long it takes to run this, to calculate all the uh, uh, distances. Sorry. Do you want to just find out how long it takes to calculate all the distances? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Right. So uh, in that case, uh, what we will do is. Uh, just before my class okay so here uh, just before my prediction part i will use this command percentage time it yes i want to know the any command to calculate the time complexity uh, through uh, uh, google collab is so, there any command uh, there is there is no way to compute the time complexity uh, using code. What you can do is you can use the percentage time it command. It will give you the uh, time taken to calculate uh, this part of the code or uh, the distances only. Okay. But uh, regarding calculating the complexity, you have to do it theoretically. Uh, you cannot do it uh, with code. Okay, okay. Uh, so do we have any other questions? Okay. 
Okay, uh, I think I'll continue. Right. Uh, no, no, so we'll continue because the questions are not coming. Okay. Okay. So uh, now uh, we are going to look at uh, TensorFlow, which is uh, an open source deep learning library uh, built by Google. Now, uh, TensorFlow is uh, one, uh, the most popular deep learning library that is in use right now. The other alternative uh, you have is PyTorch. So uh, TensorFlow uh, has a very big community, which means that uh, whenever you run into any issues regarding your code, you can seek out help on uh, different sites like GitHub or Stack Overflow. And uh, the way TensorFlow works is it builds computation graphs. So uh, you have already covered the theoretical part of neural networks, I think yesterday or uh, before this. So uh, a neural network, uh, can uh, you can look at a neural network in terms of a graph. The nodes that you have can be uh, considered as the graphical nodes, uh, the nodes in a graph that we have, and the connections between nodes can be considered as edges. So TensorFlow will create a computation graph, and uh, built on this graph, it will uh, run the entire neural net model. It is going to train uh, the uh, model and store the trained model uh, in the form of a checkpoint. And using this, you can predict uh, the results for unseen uh, test samples. So uh, we are going to use uh, Keras along with TensorFlow. Uh, Keras is a interface for TensorFlow, which is more intuitive to use than uh, raw TensorFlow itself. And of course, it's easier to use. So um, we are going to start uh, with loading custom data sets. So now we come to the part uh, uh, for the uh, question that uh, a participant had asked how to upload files into Google Colab. So the first thing that we have to do is uh, you can see this sidebar to the left. Uh, here you can see this folder icon, which uh, if you click this, it will open up the files menu. Now uh, here the, these files have already been uploaded. I'll just delete and show you again. Right, uh, so uh, when you open this menu, this is what you will see uh, in the sidebar. Now, uh, to upload files, I will click on this button. So the first button from the left. So it says upload to session storage. I'm going to click on this button. This will open up a dialog box and uh, I'm going to uh, select all the files that I want to upload to Google Colab and just click on open. And here you can see at the bottom, these files are being loaded. So once uh, these two messages go away, this yellow circle finishes uh, completing. This means that these two files have been uh, uploaded. Now, uh, once these files have, have been uploaded, I can close this uh, files menu. And uh, the data has now been uploaded. So for uh, the next, uh, demo that we are doing, we are using a house purchase data set. So this is a binary classification example where uh, given certain features of houses, I want to decide whether or not I want to buy the house. So there are five features. The first one is uh, temperature given in centigrade. The second one is humidity given in percentage. The third feature is light given in lux. The fourth feature is uh, the carbon dioxide concentration given in PPM. And the fourth feature available is water vapor to air ratio. Now, uh, this data set is already split in train and test set. So uh, we have 8,143 training samples and 2,664 test samples. So uh, I have a question. Uh, we have a question saying where can we get the data set? The data set uh, I have shared with the or uh, uh, FDP organizers. I think they'll send it to you soon.
okay so now let's proceed so uh, again we had a question asking whether or not we need numpy so in this case we will require numpy because this data set that we are uploading is in csv format uh, so uh, a csv file is basically uh, separated by commas which is uh, why the name comes csv comma separated value so uh, at first i have to import the library called numpy so uh, I am importing the library uh, NumPy as NP. Uh, so basically, this is a short form that is very commonly used for NumPy. If I did not write as NP, if I remove this part, then I would have to write NumPy here instead of NP dot uh, whatever it is that I have written. So this is an uh, this is called an alias that we commonly use to shorten the names and uh, like saves a bit of time with coding. So uh, we are importing a NumPy library here and uh, using the gen from text method of NumPy, I'm going to load the data. Now, uh, you have to first specify the path of where the data is stored. And the second thing you have to specify is the delimiter. So sometimes we have files where the uh, features are separated by tab or semicolon or some other uh, character. So in this case, uh, our uh, data has uh, Features separated by comma. So uh, to get the file path, what we do is we open up the files menu again. And can we use pandas? That's another question we have. Yes, you can use pandas. And uh, pandas would actually uh, be interesting to use because you can uh, look at the data set in a tabular format and it's. Uh, you can also find out uh, some uh, do some really cool visualizations with it. But uh, for this demo, we are sticking to NumPy. But of course, you can use pandas as well. There's no issue with that. Right. So uh, in the uh, files uh, menu that we have, I'm going to right click. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to uh, right click on the file name whose path I want to get. So uh, here we have five options. I'll click on the copy path option here. So I have, uh, now the file uh, path has been copied. I am going to paste it over here. So I use uh, single quotes or double quotes, whichever you prefer. And then I'm just going to uh, uh, paste it. Similarly, the best file, I'm again going to right click it, click on copy and paste it over here. So I hope that answers your question on how to uh, use uh, NumPy as well as uh, how to upload uh, files into Google. Now, uh, this uh, training data is being stored in this uh, matrix called uh, or NumPy array as we uh, are using NumPy. This NumPy array called train and the test data is stored in the NumPy array called test. Now, uh, I want uh, this train. Uh, uh, matrix contains uh, uh, the train array contains uh, five of uh, the five uh, features that we have and the last column is the uh, class label so we want to separate out the features and the class labels so to do that I am uh, take using these two lines so the first line what it will do is it will take the all the 8,143 samples that we have in the training set and it will take only the first five uh, uh, columns and it will store this subset of the uh, train data as training features. Similarly, uh, to get the training labels, we'll take all the 8,143 samples and we will just take the last column and we will store it in train underscore labels. Now, uh, let us uh, see the shape of the train underscore features array. Uh, OK, I, I forgot to run this uh, cell. So I just run this cell. Now I can, uh, if I run this cell, uh, it will work. Right. So uh, this is the shape of the train features array. As you can see, we have 8,143 rows and five columns. Similarly, look at the train shape. It has uh, the same number of rows and only one column in it. Uh, 
uh, okay i have a question saying is it mandatory to install python or just can do programming online so it is not required to install python that is why we are i'm uh, showing you how to use colab so colab will basically require only a google account and a browser so it will work on any operating system there is no installation whatever required uh, so you just open this uh, link uh, that i have given at the top of the uh, notebook and you can start coding right away there's no need to install anything if you want to install python of course you can but uh, just to save the hassle uh, we are using a uh, colab here and another nifty feature that google colab has is if you go to the runtime option um, and you uh, if you click on change runtime type here uh, you can uh, you get a dialog box which uh, says dial hardware accelerate accelerate so for this case we are dealing with very small data so we haven't uh, selected any hardware accelerator we can use a gpu if you have a large amount of data and if you uh, have a very very large amount of data uh, when you're dealing with big data sets or massive data sets you can also use a tpu as well so all of this is provided by google for free so this is also a feature that you can uh, get with colab in case you don't have access to a gpu uh another question to run data science code how much storage capacity is required in google colab so uh basically all this is happening in the google cloud servers if you look at uh, this part of the notebook you can see uh, ram and disk if you hover over this with your mouse you'll see uh, that you have a uh, 12.72 GB, uh, gbs of ra gb of ram al allocated and you have a disk uh, allocation of 107.77 gb so uh, this ram and this disk is allocated to you uh, from the google servers so uh, whatever you create uh, whatever you write inside the notebook is uh, kept on the google cloud server whatever you upload will also be kept in the google cloud server so uh, you don't really require any uh, minimum memory uh, or uh, minimum amount of uh, like storage uh, in your own system as long as you can open a browser and uh, browse the internet you can uh, do all of this so you don't really need a minimum system specification so uh, yeah so we were here now uh, i uh, we'll look at uh, the uh, the, uh, the first uh, samples features so we're just going to print it and you can see that uh, the features look like this this is in the uh, scientific uh, notation so we have five features as you can see here now uh, let's print the uh, class label of the first training sample so the class label is one which stands for by this house now uh, similarly we are going to separate out uh, the test features and the test labels from the test uh, set so for this we are taking all the 2664 uh, rows and the first five uh, columns for the features and all the rows and only the last column for the labels and we are printing the shape of test features similarly we are going to print the shape of test labels so uh right now uh these uh printing the test uh features shape and the test labels shape seems kind of uh, like redundant to you but when you're dealing with uh, a real application where you're coding for your own projects or uh, research problems uh, these uh, things become very helpful because you all uh, sometimes run into errors and you don't know what went wrong and where it went wrong so uh, if you uh, keep doing uh, printing the shape of these arrays it will help you in debugging so you know that uh, if the uh, if the number of rows is not the same so you know that something went wrong when uh, you were loading the data and so on so uh, now we are going to implement a simple deep feed uh, deep neural feed forward network 
So uh, this is a densely connected network that we are implementing. And for this, we are using Keras. Uh, so uh, Keras models are of two types. The first one is the sequential model, and you also have the uh, functional model. So this is a very uh, simple uh, model that we are going to build, which is why we are using the sequential API of uh, Keras. If we wanted to build a model with a lot of branching where you have multiple inputs coming in, then uh, you have branching in the neural network in different places, uh, you have multiple outputs uh, and so on. Uh, so in that, that case, you would use some, uh, something called uh, the functional API. So instead of uh, from keras.models import sequential, you would write from keras.models import functional. We're just going to look at the sequential API for now. And uh, you also have uh, different layers built into keras. Uh, so the uh, layer that we are using uh, in this example is the dense layer. You also have layers like LSTM, uh, CNN, and uh, various other layers that uh, are available. So in this case, we are going to be happy with just the dense layer. And uh, once we have imported the sequential and the uh, dense uh, functionality, we are going to create a model. So this model is of the type sequential. So that is what this line uh, does. It uh, creates a blank model, which is of the type sequential. Now, this model does not contain any layer whatsoever. So uh, I want to add layers to this model. So uh, the first layer that I'm adding is a dense layer containing five nodes. Now, uh, this first layer is basically your input layer. Now, uh, if you recall, we had uh, five features. So for each feature, we require one node. So uh, the number of nodes in my input uh, layer will always be equal to the number of features that I have. So I'm, uh, I have five features. I'm taking five nodes and I'm taking an activation function, which is ReLU. So uh, if you have not covered ReLU, uh, ReLU is basically the uh, uh, rectified uh, uh, linear function where all the values uh, greater than uh, zero, uh, greater than or equal to zero are retained and anything below zero, all the negative values are discarded. Now, uh, this is my input layer. Now I want to take two hidden layers. The first hidden layer I'm taking has, the stru uh, has a structure similar to my input layer. Uh, it also has five nodes. These are the five hidden nodes and the activation function I'm using is also ReLU. Similarly, my second hidden layer also has five hidden nodes and the activation function that we are using is also ReLU here. So uh, the activation function that you choose uh, will have a very a large impact on the performance of uh, the model that you create. So ReLU is most commonly used and it works very well for most of the data sets. So we are using ReLU here for this uh, example. <coughs> Excuse me. Now uh, we are going to add an output layer to our, to our model. So the output layer will contain only one node. Now uh, to f decide how many nodes should be in my output layer, I have to see uh, what kind of classification problem this is. So uh, this was a binary classification problem. I have only two class labels, zero or one. So only one node will suffice. Uh, if I get the probability uh, as uh, the output uh, probability from the final output node as uh, less than uh, 0.5, I can, uh, or less than or equal to 0.5, I can set it as class zero. If it is greater than 0.5, I'll uh, assign uh, the class label of one. Let's say uh, we have uh, the iris classification problem that we did earlier. In that case, uh, we would take uh, three uh, output nodes here. Uh, and in that case, instead of using the sigmoid activation function, we would use the softmax activation function. So uh, the difference here would be that uh, the softmax activation function uh, will uh, will also give you three pr uh, uh, probabilities because we'll have uh, three nodes and each uh, the summation of uh, the uh, values that you get uh, the, the sum the sum of the probabilities will be equal to one. 
So here we have a binary classification problem. That's why we are using uh, the sigmoid activation and only one uh, node in the output layer. Now, um, this model is basically, uh, it, it has uh, four layers, the input layer, the output layer, and two hidden layers in between. Now, I want to compile the model. So what compiling the model does is it will assign memory, uh, assign this model to memory as, and it's going to uh, create a space for this model in the memory so that this model uh, can be uh, trained uh, in the next step. So uh, in the compile step, I have to specify an optimizer. Uh, so the optim most popularly used optimizer that we have is the Adam optimizer. We also have optimizers like Adagrad and um, the most um, basic uh, optimizer that we have is the SG SGD or the stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so uh, you can specify the type of optimizer that you want to use just by changing this name. So uh, you can find out what names uh, are or what optimizers are available by uh, going to the TensorFlow website. We are using the Adam optimizer here. And we also have to specify a loss function. So uh, this is basically uh, to uh, for backpropagation to work. We have to uh, specify a loss function. Here we are using binary cross entropy. And uh, we are also specifying a metric which will let us decide how well the training is going on. And uh, in this case, we are using the accuracy metric. You can use other metrics as well. Now, uh, now that we have our model ready, we are going to train the model. So to train the model, we use uh, this command model.fit. The model.fit uh, method will take as input the training features and the training labels. So these are the two uh, inputs you have to provide. Along with this, you have to provide a batch size. So uh, I think you have covered uh, batch sizes and epochs in the theory session. Um, if not, I'll just uh, give you a brief overview. A batch size uh, basically tells you how many samples will be processed at one time before uh, the error is being backpropagated. Okay, uh, I have a question, ma'am. What is the role of optimizer? Right, uh, so I think you have covered the stochastic gradient descent uh, in class. So uh, the Adam optimizer uh, is uh, something very similar to that. It is the algorithm that is being used to minimize the error. So uh, the, the error minimization uh, can happen in various ways. Here, uh, instead of the stochastic gradient descent method, we are using the Adam optimizer. And you have other such uh, algorithms as well. These algorithms that are used to uh, minimize the error or the loss that we have here are called optimizers. Uh, and uh, coming back to epochs, uh, so epochs is basically uh, the number uh, one epoch is basically uh, telling you that I am going to cover the entire training data one time. So if I uh, say that uh, I have uh, I want to run uh, uh, train this model for 10 epochs, I am going to go over the entire data set in batches of 100 samples each. After 100 samples are processed, I am going to back propagate the error, update the weight matrices, and uh, this will continue till the entire data set is covered. So this makes one epoch. I want to repeat this process for 10 times. So I am setting the epoch value as 10. Now I am going to uh, run this part of the code. So uh, we can see that uh, batch will be same for each epoch. Yes, uh, batch will be same for each epoch. You cannot uh, vary the batch size between different epochs uh, if you are using this command. Um, and uh, what you could do uh, uh, is uh, you can fit the model uh, with a batch size of 100 for one epoch, and then uh, you can. Uh, train the model, uh, continue training the model, uh, uh, another step where you can specify a different batch size. But 
is uh, uh, it's while it's theoretically feasible it is going to give you an error in the code because uh, all of this is stored in the form of a computation graph okay so uh, once you have specified a batch size of 100 and if you change it again uh, uh, i am unable to understand you have said batch items i'm not sure what you mean by batch items can you please clarify puja saini Yes. Um, can you uh, repeat your question? Yes. Okay, okay, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, in this case, uh, the uh, batch items will remain the same. So, if I wanted to change the batch items, I would have to use a shuffles uh, variable here, and uh, which would go something like this: shuffle equals uh, true. If I set this shuffle value as true, in that case, uh, in, uh, the batch uh, items will change in each epoch. That's a very good question that you asked. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, now I'm going to uh, come back to uh, the training process uh, that we have here. So uh, you can see that uh, each epoch is listed here in the output. And uh, each of the epochs, uh, the time taken for each uh, step is also given. And uh, we also have a loss after each epoch. You can see that the loss is decreasing after each epoch is uh, completed and the accuracy value is increasing. So this loss and this accuracy is for the training data because uh, this training uh, uh, portion has only been given the training features and training labels. It has not seen the test data yet. So, uh, we have achieved an accuracy of uh, 0.87 or 87 um, percent on the training data. Let's see how this model performs on our test data. So to evaluate uh, our model on the test data, we have to pass the test features and the test labels. So we see that uh, the loss is uh, 0.46 and the accuracy is 0.89 which is uh, pretty decent like 89% accuracy is not too bad okay uh, I will discuss about overfitting uh, just after I have covered this so um, an accuracy of 89% is not too bad so uh, what you can do here is you can uh, change the number of epochs to say 50 you can change the batch sizes as well and you can see uh, what kind of performance you get. So let's change it, uh, change the number of epochs to 50 and see if the performance improves or not. Right now on the test data, we have an accuracy of 89%. Let's see what we get now after 50 epochs. So the accuracy has improved. It is 97% uh, now. So uh, I have this question from madhulina sarkar uh, asking okay uh, if accuracy is low what do we do to improve accuracy okay i'll come to this question after i have discussed overfitting so this question uh, regarding overfitting now uh, you can uh, if we look at this uh, training part you can see here that uh, right so uh, if you look at the accuracy scores over here, you can see that the accuracy scores are more or less increasing. So uh, we can say that the training is going on pretty well. Now, uh, because uh, this accurate, uh, because this model is uh, because this accuracy that you get here in the training process is calculated entirely on the training data. Uh, so if you train the data for a, a very large number of epochs. Uh, in that case, what happens is the uh, uh, the uh, network sort of memorizes uh, the samples. And if you give it a sample that it has not seen yet, 
so in that case your training accuracy will be very high it will even achieve like uh, say uh, 99% or uh, something like that or some a very high accuracy but in that case your test accuracy will be uh, pretty low so uh, in this uh, case overfitting has not occurred how i can say this is because my training data accuracy is 97% and my test data accuracy is also 97% so there's barely any difference uh, uh, in uh, these two so whenever this happens that your training accuracy is very high and the test accuracy is uh, not close to the training accuracy uh, you know that you have overfit your model so uh, how you can remedy overfitting uh, the first uh, thing you can do is you can uh, decrease the number of epochs that is one uh, possibility the second possibility is uh, you can change the architecture of the model that you're using so let's say instead of two hidden layers if i took only one hidden layer or uh, sometimes we uh, come up with like a model with say 25 hidden layers and my data set has only five features and uh, so uh, that is uh, generally going to overfit the model so if i used like like say 20 25 hidden layers in this data set it's definitely going to overfit the model because uh, the complexity of the data is not very high and uh, using a very large neural net uh, it's going to overfit so uh, you can also change the net, uh, you can also decrease the number of layers that is the second possibility you can do to avoid overfitting if you notice that there has been overfitting and the third thing you can do is you can decrease the number of uh, hidden nodes so these are the three things you can try out um, to uh, remedy overfitting now uh, coming to the next question if accuracy is low what do we do to improve accuracy okay so uh, accuracy can be low for many reasons so uh, let's first uh, look at uh, the training accuracy let's say if my training accuracy is very low what does this mean so this means that my neural net has not been able to learn from my data now this could be because uh, the first reason could be because i don't have many samples uh, so this data set is, has uh, some 8000 uh, plus uh, training samples which is a decent size of data set but if i uh, use a very large uh, uh, deep neural net model on say uh, a data uh, data set containing only 100 samples so uh, uh, i'm sorry uh, so uh, let's say uh, i have a, a very a large number of features so let's say i have uh, like a, a data set with 1000 features and i am using this particular data uh, this particular network with two hidden layers of five nodes each uh, the chances are very high that my training accuracy will be very low because my network is not sufficiently large enough to capture all the intricacies of my data so in that case my training accuracy will be very low and what we have to do there is we can first increase the size of the network. Now, uh, after increasing the size of the network, uh, again, the second possibility that we have is if we have very less number of samples, then also my training accuracy can be very low. Uh, the, the solution for that would be to increase my training data size, which is not always possible. Uh, in that case, we generally, um, in real life, we try out uh, different architectures. So it's uh, le it's cheaper to uh, build a new neural net architecture than to uh, gather data in some cases. So uh, that is one part of uh, low accuracy. The second part is, let's say your training accuracy is decent, but your test accuracy is very low. In that case, your model has overfitted. So uh, the uh, so you can try out the remedies that I mentioned for overfitting. And the first uh, example that I gave where your accuracy uh, for the training data is very low, that means your model ha uh, has been underfitted. So these are the two possibilities that you can have and these are the possible remedies that you can try out. So um, as a practitioner, I can tell you that uh, building deep neural nets is more or less like uh, just trying out different things. Uh, you have th rules of thumb that you can uh, follow, but uh, it's, it basically comes down to the data set that you're using and the architecture and uh, even uh, what optimizer you're using. So these are the hyper parameters uh, that affect uh, the quality of your neural net to a very large extent. So it's more or less a trial and error uh, when it comes to neural networks. So uh, 
I'll uh, come back to our notebook. So uh, now I want to predict uh, the probabilities for the first five test samples. So for this, I'm using model dot predict and passing the first five samples of the uh, test data set. So uh, you can see that uh, these are the first uh, five. Uh, uh, these are the predict uh, probabilities predicted by our neural net for the first five test samples. Now uh, let's look at the uh, labels that have been predicted. So for this, I'm printing the test labels. The test labels are all one here because all of these probabilities are greater than one. Now, uh, do we have any other questions regarding TensorFlow and neural nets? Otherwise, I uh, discuss some general issues that you uh, deal with uh, building uh, neural nets and ML models. OK, so because there are no questions I can see, I am going to proceed. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box. I'll address them as and when they come. So uh, once you get your uh, notebook, this notebook uh, will be shared with you. So the first thing I would suggest. OK, so the question from uh, Matulina Sarkar, parallel computing in TensorFlow. Right. So. Uh, by default, uh, we uh, we are using a CPU here. So uh, in CPU, the um, level of parallelism that you can achieve is by multi-threading. So you can set the number of threads uh, in TensorFlow, uh, and uh, that will uh, introduce some amount of parallelism to your uh, code while while it's uh, while it's running. But uh, if you really want to uh, utilize the power of parallelism you would have to uh, set the runtime as GPU. So uh, that will uh, ensure that wherever parallel computations are possible, it will be taken care of by the TensorFlow backend itself. You will not have to uh, write a separate code for that. It's all taken care of by TensorFlow. Any example? Right. So um, let's say uh, you have, um, OK, uh, let's go back to the KNN example here. OK, uh, an example of the code. I do not have it ready, but um, I will share it. Uh, uh, when I reshare the notebook with you, I'll share an example of the code for introducing the uh, uh, multi-threading part of a TensorFlow. That will, uh, to do that, you will uh, re uh, require to use the raw TensorFlow interface. You cannot use uh, Keras to do that. So uh, it's a bit uh, of a. Uh, it's just a one or two lines of code, uh, but I'll share it with you. I don't have it with me right now. Right, uh, so I'm going to proceed. Now, uh, once you get this notebook, I would recommend that you go to the file menu and you open in, uh, you select this option, open in playground mode. So, uh, if you do this, what happens is uh, you'll uh, see this message uh, saying this notebook is in playground mode. Changes will not be saved. So uh, what uh, you can do is once you put the, uh, put this notebook in uh, playground mode, you can play around with the different uh, settings that we have used. So uh, you can change the optimizer. You can change the number of layers and uh, nodes and uh, etc. And uh, you can just uh, 
try out various options and that will not change the original notebook so that you can always refer back to it instead of uh, modifying the original notebook because uh, it might introduce errors because you're trying it out for the first time. So I would recommend that you try this out in the playground mode. Um, another uh, issue that uh, I would like to uh, focus on here is that uh, these activation functions that you have uh, when you're building a neural net you can uh, try out uh, different activation functions as well and uh, for that uh, uh, this is basically again going by uh, the experimentation method you have to uh, just try out different things and see what works for your data but uh, for the output layer this activation function is always going to be either sigmoid or softmax. You cannot uh, really play around with uh, this activation function. The other activation functions in the uh, input layer, in the hidden layers, you can change them as per your wish. Uh, for the uh, binary classification problem, it will be sigmoid. And for the multi-class classification problem, it will be softmax. So that is something you, uh, uh, you have to keep in mind. And... Yeah, I think I have uh, more or less covered all that I wanted to cover in this session. So if you have any questions, you can uh, ask me right now or if you go through the notebook later on and if you uh, notice any uh, problems that you think you are facing, then you can also uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, is it possible to show some steps to use playground mode? Hello. Okay. Yeah. Hello, yes. Hello madam. Uh, if I want to use uh, raw data and before process the raw data, so noise reduction is required. So yes. how, uh, how how can I solve it? So noise reduction, is there is any technique or there is any yes. uh, comment to reduce the noise? Yes, uh, for uh, noise reduction, uh, for uh, principal component analysis and these different pre-processing steps, mm -hmm. you have um, you have various functions inside scikit-learn. So uh, I'll just uh, look it up. I'll just open this uh, link and show it to you. Take me a minute. Uh, so I hope you can see this. Yes, yes. So this, these are the various options that you have for pre-processing the data. Um, for noise reduction, uh, I'm not sure what sort of data you will be using, uh, but you can. Um, I'm using I'm using ECG signal data. Signal data. Okay. Uh, I do not work with signal data, so I'm not sure what kind of uh, noise reduction would be appropriate. But uh, if there is, uh, from these pre-processing uh, functions that you have available in uh, scikit-learn, the ones listed here, if uh, you think one of these is suitable for your problem, you can use this. Okay. But I, 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 don't, I'm not, I do not use ECG data, so I will not be able to help you with that. Okay. But for uh, text and all, you can uh, you have options like uh, the TF IDF and count vectorizer and uh, many such options. Uh, I can help you with the text part, but I do, I am not very sure about the signal data. Okay, and another question. Uh, yes. When when classification accuracy will be better if the uh, 
training data accuracy is more than the uh, testing data accuracy uh, can you rephrase your question again actually i want to know uh, suppose accuracy of training data is uh, less than the testing data then uh, classification accuracy will be better or not uh, you so cannot say it will be when classification result will be better if the accuracy of testing and so, training both uh, are same, equal or not no no uh, there is no such uh, uh, rule uh, to say that if uh, these two have to, uh, the training data accuracy and the testing data accuracy have to be equal or uh, very close to each other or one is better than the other generally mm. what we follow is uh, we look at the problem that we are trying to solve so let's say we have a binary classification problem mm. now uh, if uh, i assign uh, the same label to all the samples by default i am going to get a 50% accuracy so even uh, the worst possible classifier will achieve at least 50% accuracy uh, okay. but now again if i have let's say a 10 class classification problem and i achieve uh, my uh, classifier achieves an accuracy of 50% it's uh, much better uh, than the uh, than the performance of the classifier that I had for binary classification, even though both of them achieved the same accuracy value. Okay. So uh, this uh, nothing to do with uh, the training or the test uh, accuracy. But yes, uh, one uh, the only uh, thing that it will help you with is if your training data accuracy is very low, it means your model has underfitted. You need to. Actually, yeah. you, have told, you have told us uh, when the accuracy of uh, training data is less than the uh, testing data, uh, that time the overfitting is occurred. That's what I'm telling you. Okay, no, so, no, no. Uh, overfitting uh, is I the think... problem? Overfitting is the no. problem? No, so I uh, I think uh, you uh, uh, I think I uh, miss uh, I think you misunderstood what I tried to say. So overfitting is a problem when the training data accuracy is uh, more than that of uh, that of the uh, test data, and by more I mean uh, a huge difference. So let let's look at this example. You we have a training data accuracy of ninety eight percent. Uh, the test data accuracy is 97%. So this is yes. less than that of the training data. Training data. But uh, overfitting has not occurred because these two are pretty close to each other. Right. So let's say if this was 98% and my test data accuracy was something like 67% or something uh, uh, with a very large margin of difference, then I would say that overfitting has occurred. No, this part is clear. My question is uh, if overfitting is occurred, then what type of problem will be uh, produced? Okay, so this is clear. My question, my question is okay. if the overfitting is occurred, then what type of problem will be uh, occur for the classification? Okay, if your model has already overfitted, that means your model is basically memorizing the training uh, data. So, in that case, your uh, test data will not be uh, getting a good accuracy. So, you cannot say that your model is very good or your model has learned well so uh, this is uh, actually undesirable what you want uh, ideally is that your training data accuracy and your test data accuracy will be pretty close to each other and also they'll be uh, pretty uh, both of them will be pretty high uh, when you're considering the problem that you're considering let's say for a binary classification problem you want it to be much more than 50 percent for a 10 class classification problem uh, let's say 60 percent or something like that would be very good uh, but both of these have to be pretty close to each other. Otherwise, when overfitting has occurred, it means your model is memorizing everything instead of learning or uh, learning from the uh, features. It is not able to generalize. Okay, okay. Okay, ma'am, thank you. So, um, I'm going to show you a few steps in the playground mode. Uh, so this notebook is already in the playground mode. Now let's say um, I want to run the code that is present here. So I follow the same steps that I showed you earlier. Uh, you just write the code in a cell and you uh, press the execute button. Uh, so you can see that it is being connected to the runtime. Yes, 
uh, so you have got the output here and you will also see this message cannot save changes so basically you can try out different things it will not change the content of the notebook uh, so uh, this is what uh, the playground mode can be used for without changing the notebook you can just try out different things Uh, do we have any other questions? Any questions from the participants, please? No, I think ma'am, there is no more question. Okay. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for uh, listening to this talk and uh, if you face any problems with the notebook uh, or the data that will be shared with you please feel free to email me. Uh, so please tell about the data set. So the data set will be shared with you. Thank you ma'am. Thank you so much. For the lab session which you have uh, taken and the information which you have given. And if anybody is interested, uh, if they have any query, they will just mail you. Uh, since I'm not seeing any other questions coming up in the chat box. Okay, so we will end here. We will come back at sharp two the for the next session. And the folks are asking for your mail ID. If possible, you can share it. Yeah, yeah, I'll share. And we'll provide and all the link uh, related to all the materials so what we have given to us. Uh, yes, I have already sent them to uh, Hirok sir, and uh, he provided. Okay, okay. okay. I'll share okay. it. Okay, sir. So, thank you so much. Bye bye.